Today, I'll be going over the greenhouse gas protocol. I did want to preface this with just a few comments. In general, the greenhouse gas protocol ha has a very strong focus on the organizational level. So if you compare it to an IREC, which is more of a point source with like attributes and kilowatt hour data. And then for Vera, it's like a project focus. Here, we're taking it to maybe another higher level. Uh, of an organizational level. The standard in and of itself is not extremely complicated, but automating it and recreating it in for our solution, I took a few creative liberties, but just when we get to the workflow and the schema, consider that more of a suggested approach that we can adapt and discuss together rather than a way that it has to be. It was just some of my ideas of, of how to do it. But uh, I'll jump in here. And so a little bit about the GHG protocol, it's the prevailing GHG inventory standard when Fortune 500 companies and large corporations are doing their corporate greenhouse gas inventories. It's generally with the greenhouse gas protocol, also several other standards like a PAS 2060 for carbon neutrality also defer to the greenhouse gas protocol for the measuring of GHG portion of their standards. So it's a pretty well established as the leading standard for that. Like I said, it focuses on the company or organizational level, a little bit less uh, straightforward than a project or generation based standards. It's based on a 20 year partnership between WRI, WRI and WBCSD. They also have a service called built on GHG protocol, a little background on that's they don't actually verify inventories. What they'll do is review sort of tools or guidance, maybe some, maybe something like the solution that like the guardian and they give their stamp of approval that like a solution or a tool or a, or a guidance is in uh, alignment with their standard. They actually don't directly verify inventories. They actually don't explicitly require verification or assurance at all. A lot of GHG protocol inventories actually aren't verified. So there's not like a VVB, like in, in the other, the other standards and the general approach is a bottom up approach. So they, uh, you start with a uh, source and facilities data on sources at specific facilities and assets, and then aggregate it to an organizational total. And so there's Several GHG protocol standards and guidance documents. For standards, there's the corporate accounting and reporting standard. That's that's the main document that, that most of these inventories are referring to. They also have a scope three standard. Scope three is currently not required. They have standards for product life cycles, project accounting. So that's more of a project-based offset standard. They have a standard for actions. So estimating GHGs for certain actions or decisions, mitigation, and they have one for community scale inventories as well. For this, we're going to be focusing on the corporate accounting and reporting standard. That's the main document that is going to be the most relevant for our applications. And for the guidance document, we're going to be going over the scope two guidance, which even though it's a guidance document and not technically a standard, it's considered an, an amendment to the corporate protocol. So to, to be in alignment with the corporate protocol, you also have to, to, oops, to use the scope two guidance, but then there's also scope three and some agricultural guidance, some reporting of board emissions, but. These are a little bit more specialized, and I think covering these two will capture the main applications of, of this standard. Yeah, so some really different things with this standard compared to the other standards that we've gone over is that they don't require you to report your uh, GHG inventories to them. They don't manage a registry. There are some GHG registries, but they're not managed by WRI. They're not, and WRI does not require you to submit to them. So it's, it's really different than Vera and, and IREC in, in that standard, in that sense. It encourages, but it does not require third-party verification. And then it's generally built on these principles of rel relevance, completeness, consistency, transparency, and accuracy. The first sort of step in creating a GHG protocol inventory is to set organizational boundaries. 
you select one of two approaches, the equity share approach or the operational control approach. With equity share, you are responsible for the emissions proportionate to your equity. So if you only have 25% equity or if you have 65% equity, you'll be responsible for 65% of those emissions. Under operational control, they're responsible for 100% of any entity that they have operational control over, but they can exclude any entity that they have less than 50% equity in or no operational control. In. And then the, either one of these approaches has to be applied consistently throughout the entire organization. So you can't have you know, one entity or facility use equity share and another use operational control. You pick one up front and you apply it consistently. Also, if there's joint ventures, both of those entities should be using the same. So if you have 65% of, of a joint venture um, and you use the equity share, your partner should be using the equity share as well and being responsible for that other 35%. From the organizational boundaries, you want to set up your operational boundaries. You want to identify the emission sources and operational assets being something like a facility or an owned fleet of vehicles. And then you want to categorize sources as direct or indirect choosing inventory or scope, you can choose to do either scope one and two or scope one, two, and three. And then you categorize sources by scope. This is something that can be automated in my opinion. So if you have purchased electricity as a source, it's pretty easy to have it automatically categorized into which scope these are. And you have to account for and report scope one and two at a minimum and you have to report them individually, scope three is optional. And then here's a little figure about operational and organizational boundaries. Here we have the organizational boundaries, could be a parent company and uh, a set of entities that they own, and then operational boundaries below that being the representing the corporate assets that would have GHG emissions like a car fleet, a fleece factory, power generation unit, things of that sort. That's what you want to be uh, scoping out as part of the GHG process, GHG protocol process. And then here's just a little illustration of the different scopes. Scope two is generally purchased electricity, but it could also be purchased steam or cooling heating. But those are generally things that while they are purchased, the entity has some sort of operational control over, such as like facility electrical consumption, but someone who is still purchasing their electricity from another entity, they still have some uh, control over their consumption. Scope one being direct fuel combustion, company owned vehicles. And then scope three is indirect things that are associated with the, the supply chain, indirect emissions. So for tracking emissions over time, uh, you choose a base year. It's generally the earliest year of data availability. You have to provide a justification for the base year that you select. Generally, it's one year, but it is allowed to have uh, multi-year averages. And for baseline calculation, there, there can be baseline recalculations. So that's so to make sure that companies are comparing apples to apples. And to, to illustrate that point, for example, if a company acquired another company a couple of years after they set their baseline and they have data for that company that they acquired for the year of their baseline, they're allowed to recalculate their baseline based on that data because in future years, they'll have that entity and you want to be tracking apples to apples. There's certain context where baseline can be recalculated. And I think that is an interesting topic of discussion for us because I'm not exactly sure how to handle things like baseline recalculations in an immu immutable environment, but I'm sure maybe some of you guys have some ideas of how to handle that, but that should certainly be in our radar that certain changes can trigger regulations and their structural changes like acquisitions, divestments, and mergers. Um, if you start using a new methodology, you can recalculate 
the baseline based on that new methodology. Improved data and factors can become available. There could be a cumulative effect of numerous small changes that could warrant a recalculation. S significant outsources, errors, and other reasons to recalculate, but you don't recalculate if it's organic growth. Some other rules for recalculation, if the facilities did not exist in the base year, if it's outsourcing or insourcing from scope one to scope two, or organic growth or decline, they do not trigger recalculations. If the change happened in mid-year, you can recalculate for the entire year. If the, and if you can recalc for the fo the following year if data is available. And then, yeah, I already brought this up is how can we account for this in, in an immutable environment? But we can discuss that later. Here's what I was talking about earlier. If you have an acquisition, let's say a couple of years, here's your base year, a couple of years later, you have an acquisition um, and they have this facility, you can add that facility consumption to your base year and any year in between. So that year on year and years after, you're still comparing apples to apples. So identifying GHG sources and calculating emissions. So first you wanna identify your sources and you wanna list all your sources and just have conclusions or ex exclusions. Categorize them into the scopes, assign locations and entities to the sources so you can take a look at the data. You can cut up the data based on different locations and, and entities. We select a calculation approach for each GHG source. So the GHG protocol allows for direct measurement or the use of emissions factors. They generally focus on emissions factors basically because they're the most common and the, the, the most easy to deal with at the moment. But I will also note on that if we're using emissions factors, we can still use real-time data. It would just be like real-time data such as electrical consumption, but it would still apply the emission factor for that grid or whatever the appropriate emission factor would be. But uh, using emissions factor doesn't mean that we, we can't still use real-time data. It acknowledges though that direct measurement is more accurate and higher data quality. And if you have access to both sets of data, it requires to use the most accurate approach that you have available. It's just that a lot of companies don't have uh, direct measuring devices on all their sources. So, sorry. Once you've identified all your sources, you collect the data and you choose the appropriate emissions factors for each source. You, you can apply calculation tools. And then at the end, you roll up the data to the corporate level. Accounting for reductions is emissions over time relative to the base year. You can explain any changes if, they, if they're associated with acquisitions, divestments, closures, actual reductions, change in production level. It's good to add some context. The general reporting requirements are outlined here. Um, the reporting period, you want to have a description of the inventory boundaries, which include the organizational boundaries, the operational boundaries, any exclusions you have, the different scope one and two have to be reported separately. You have to disclose the methodologies. Each GHG gas is to be reported separately. For example, if you're doing electrical consumption, there'll be emission, there'll be emission factors for CO2 for NH4 and N2O. And you can normalize that into CO2 equivalents. But for the report, they want to have the totals for each one individually, as well as the GHG equivalent total. Do they need you to disclose any base baseline or any recalculations and the context that triggered the recalculation? Identify any discrepancies in previous years and then any emissions and trades they want you to report separately. So if you have 100 metric tons of CO2 emissions and you buy 100 tons of offsets, they still want you to show that you originally had 100 tons of CO2 emissions prior to netting that out. And then some optional but encouraged reporting items are uh, scope three, subdividing the data into facility region and sources, benchmarking, intensity KPIs such as greenhouse gas emissions relative to revenue or square footage, any external assurance or verification. But as I said, that's not a strict requirement at the moment, offsets as well. So the verification, GHG, yeah, I can't be going over this, but GHG protocol does not require 
verification of inventories. They don't certify verif verifiers. They don't explicitly require it. There are various verification standards and the CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project, they have a list of approved standards that, that they have approved. So I just put this here because if we do want to integrate the verification aspect to this standard, these are some of the standards that are approved by a well-respected organization. And then certain companies, they offer verification services such as SCS. They're accredited by ANSI. They're under ISO 14065. And there's a rule that you can't measure and verify for the same org. Apparently that's a conflict of interest. So that's an interesting note. I didn't, that wasn't actually in the greenhouse gas protocol that was on the SCS website. So um, setting a GHG target. So there's actually, though they go into a lot of depth of how to set targets and how to measure progress towards the targets, they actually don't explicitly say that you must set a target. So that's important to note. And there's different target types. There's absolute targets, meet, meaning to reduce the absolute emissions, intensity targets, basically improving the performance based on intensity. And then there's also, um, since the G greenhouse gas protocol was published, they came out with science-based targets, which we've discussed a little bit in the past, but that's basically just targets that are validated by the science-based target initiative, showing that they're in accordance with the current scientific thresholds that have been estimated for basically how much greenhouse gas we need to reduce as a whole to avoid catastrophic consequences. You need to also disclose the, the target boundary, which greenhouse gases it applies to, which geographic areas it applies to, which sources it applies to. Usually it's all the applicable GHGs and geographical areas, but sometimes there are some cases where Certain areas can be excluded or certain sources can be excluded from a target and target base years. Usually it's a fixed year, but it could be multi-year average. It could be rolling. And then you need to disclose your completion date and the commitment period. The commitment period is usually a single year. It could be a multi-year average, but basically what that means is if the commitment period is one year, so let's say 2050, as long as you've reduced the emissions in that year of 2050 relative to your baseline, you've still made your target. So you can fluctuate a little bit in between going up and down. And then as long as you hit it in that year, then that's a single year. But there's also multi-year averages, which are a bit less common. And then the target level being if it's reducing by 100%, by 50%, et cetera. So... The use of offsets, they suggest to specify the origin and nature, like the project type or the methodology. Offsets can be applied to intensity targets. So you can negate the offsets from the numerator when you're calculating progress to, towards intensity targets, but they report absolute emissions separately. The scope two guidance, this is where things get a little complicated, but to give you a little background and we've discussed this on some other presentations but when rex were inter rec the basically the concept of rex became popular after the original greenhouse gas protocol was published but what ended up happening is when you sell rex and you don't update the grid emissions factor the renewable energy from that rec is actually double counted so they released scope two guidance to address that. In my opinion, they half addressed that or made some progress towards addressing that, but we'll jump into the scope two guidance and, and how they, how they address double counting. Yeah. Like I said before, this is an amendment to the corporate protocol. So they're to be used in conjunction. They can almost, almost be viewed as a collective standard and they introduced something called the dual reporting requirement. And that's specifically to address double counting. So what's the dual reporting requirement? So for scope two, if you have any operations in markets that have contractual agreements, so any markets where RECs are being sold or there's uh, power purchase agreements or supplier specific 
emissions factors, anything like that will trigger a dual reporting requirement so that if you have that requirement, which at this point, most, most will, but you'll have to calculate your scope to emissions based on two different methods. One's the location-based method, which is using average emission intensity of the grid based on emissions. So certain uh, e-grid subregions will have a location base emissions factor. And then also with market-based emit, uh, a market-based method, and that's more emissions factors are used from chosen sources such as RECs um, or residual mix factors, which are basically location-based emissions factors, but with sold renewable energy accounted for to avoid double counting. So they want you to report both totals. And I wanted to also bring up the point is if you're going to report two different totals for that, which will they base the C, which will we base the CET tokens on? The totals that use location or the totals that use market-based methods. It seems to me that you can choose which one you want to use, which isn't a really perfect solution, but I think that's okay to do within the standard. They want you to disclose total electrical consumption and for each source or facility they want you to, or location, they want you to disclose if there's an absence or existence of a residual mix factor. So actually recently Green E started, and this was, I believe after scope two came out, Green E started publishing residual mix factors for the US. So that's actually uh, somewhat of a new development. I think that started in, in 2019 or something. So with contracts, with, with market-based, you can use the emissions factor for, for, and apply the, the emissions factor of the contractual agreement to your activity data. So if you have a facility, let's say in Philadelphia, and they use one megawatt of kilowatt hours, instead of using the emissions factor from whichever grid Philadelphia is hooked up to, for that one megawatt of hour, if you've purchased a rec and retired it, you can actually apply the zero tons of CO2 per kilowatt hour emissions factor to that. So it allows you to reduce your, it allows you to actually reduce your calculated scope to emissions while, while offsets let you net emissions. So sources with no specified choices. So when you're going through the and doing the inventory, not every source is going to well, for the most part, not every source is going to be able to have a rec applied to that consumption. So for anything that doesn't have a contractual emission rate to use, they use residual mix factors to avoid double counting. And if there's no residual mix factor, you can use location base. And there's some scope to quality criteria that we'll get into a little bit later. And then location base is just simply the average emissions factor times the activity data, like kilowatt hours. Excuse me. So, uh, so you, so to calculate scope two emissions, you identify the emission source for scope two emissions. It's basically going to be indirect consumption of, of facilities. And then you determine if there's a market, if the market-based approach applies. So that would basically be if you're in a region that has these mechanisms available. And then if they do, you calculate market-based for the entire inventory and you calculate location-based for the entire inventory for just scope two. So then you collect activity data and you choose emission factors. So there's a hierarchy of data and they want you to choose the best data available. And we'll get into that. There's a hierarchy of, for both location and market based. And then you calculate um, the emissions. All activity data must be assigned an emissions factor. And then you apply global warming potentials if applicable. And that's what I was saying earlier, where you'll we'll have each GHG, each greenhouse, different greenhouse gas reported separately. And then the global warming potentials are used to convert non-CO2 GHGs into CO2 equivalents and then uh, roll up to the corporate level for some corporate totals. So here's the, the process for determining which accounting method to use. It starts off with the question, do you 
have the contractual uh, mechanisms like RECs and residual mix factors available in, in the area. And uh, if you do, you'll report scope two totals with both the dual reporting. For market-based, you'll determine each energy consuming facility and apply supplier specific data that meet the scope two criteria. And I'll go over the scope two criteria in a bit. And if it does, you'll calculate it with based on the, the scope, the market-based approach. And if not, you'll use residual mix factors or location-based factors. You'll defer to the hierarchy of data quality. If not, then you'll just report based on location-based methods. Here's the hierarchy for location-based data. This is basically they prefer regional or sub-regional emissions factors, and then lower than that will be national production emissions factors. For the U.S., there's the entire U.S. is mapped out with e-grid sub-regions, so that's good here. But then for some other foreign countries, you'll have to use just a national average. And for market-based, at the top, we have energy attribute certificates, basically RECs, contractual instruments like power purchase agreements, supplier utility specific emission rates, and then residual mix factors. And then at the bottom, basically, is the location-based emissions factors. So here's an example of market-based. Actually, I think maybe I'll go over location. Yeah, go location first. So here's an example of location-based uh, calculations. Basically, you have, here they grouped them all together, U.S. facilities. Basically, you have activity data like consumption here. You've got your e-grid subregion. These Emissions factors are specific to this e-grid subregion, and there's like an Excel spreadsheet that has all these in one place. So you can calculate each greenhouse gas separately, and then you calculate, and then you calculate the total separately, and then normalize them to CO2e, and then you just do that for each subregion and different countries. In this example, for Denmark, they don't have CH4 and, and N2O emissions factors. So it's just CO2, but if they did, you're required to, to use those, but sometimes they're not available. And then for market-based, basically what they have is, so here's like the U.S. operations and they're purchasing some RECs for, for that amount of, for this amount of consumption, you're applying the, rec, the RECs, which have a zero CO2 per megawatt hour emissions factor. So you have zero emissions for this piece of it. For this, you have a PPA and rec retention, also zero emissions factor. And then you still have over here a uh, hundred megawatt hours left over. And for that one, they're deferring to basically location-based e-grid subregion grid average emissions factors. They're saying here that residual mix not available in the U.S., but that actually has changed since then. So that's the approach for, for market-based. And uh, another thing to note is that to apply a rec to this consumption, it has to be from the same market and general location. That's something that they specify in the quality criteria. And so they outlined some quality criteria. Most of these, I think, will be met by most of uh, the recs that you purchased, basic, pretty easy uh, stuff, except I want you to pay uh, close attention to number five here saying that they must be sourced from the same market in which the reporting entity entities, electrical consuming operations are located and to which the instrument is applied. So they just want you to match recs from the same market. For scope two reporting requirements, the impact of dual reporting on totals, you can have two totals and then for your targets, you can choose which one you want to use for your targets, which I, which I leads me to believe that you should be able to choose which one you want to use for your CET generation. The methodology used, the base year information, the same stuff from the corporate standard. Oops. Target specified if it's market or location. Note if residual mix factors were available. 
they want you to report the percentage of electricity consumed for which contractual information was avail available, such as the rec emissions factors or residual mix factors. Now that Greeny has published them for all of US, the, the availability, there's now there's mix residual mix factors available in the US. Uh, they're not quite perfect though yet, but that's a whole other discussion. Instrument features and policy context. And they actually noted that you know, there's solutions that involve re real-time data. They want you to report that separately. Um, not exactly sure why, but that kind of seems like maybe a little bit of a roadblock but I don't, I don't really understand the reason why you can't just use that for the, for your normal totals. But yeah, they say they want, if you're using that, they say they want you to report that separate. So tracking remix, remit over time, setting a base here, basically if it's market-based, use the year where both data were available. So if you're setting a base year and you're using market-based, you don't want to use a base year where location totals were used because you want to be comparing apples to apples. Dual reporting itself, if you are now required to use dueling, dual reporting and you weren't when you set your base year, maybe before that scope two standard came out, that's that can actually recalc trigger a, a recalculation. Specify your methods for your set for setting targets. Oh, so if you're generating renewable energy and selling your recs, the actual to avoid to avoid double counting, you can't generate the en the entity cannot generate and sell the certs and still claim the attributes. So if they're selling, if they're generating and selling the recs, the power that they're using actually becomes null power, and they use and they're to use either residual mixed factors or location based factors, and report that under scope two. So that's a consideration there. So yeah, just to wrap oh, this GHGP workflow is just my first sort of crack at this. But as you can maybe see, this is a very internal process. There's, I guess you can say GHGP is the root authority, but they're not really verifying anything and they're not really like issuing any certifications. They're not requiring verification. There's no registry. It's a highly internal process. I came up with a, a general approach to how maybe this process could be uh, automated and recreated it for the Guardian, but just view this as a conversation starter. But I was thinking maybe an organization can start by creating a profile. And then at the beginning of each reporting period, they would update their profile and report any structural changes or acquisitions and things like that. Certain updates that they make could maybe automatically trigger a recalculation requirement, new requirements, but maybe that's a bit further down the road to implement. And then once you have an organizational profile, they can maybe click something like click to add sort of thing where they click and add an entity to the organization. And then, so the organizational profile would be one schema. And then you click to add an entity and assign that to the organization. And there'd be like a schema for entities, which information we want to capture about an entity. And then within the entity, you can click and assign an operational asset. And then you can assign sources to the operational assets. Then you can assign devices to the sources. The data from the devices could be sent to a VVB to verify, to verify Oh, wait. The, so VVB could verify the device and then the devices could send data to HCS. The Guardian could verify the data and auto calculate emissions. Perhaps we can also allow for a human VVB to validate the data to maybe just add a, an extra layer of verification, or I, I'm not really sure how we want to handle the VVB aspect of this. If the guardian itself is verifying the emissions, this could be an application where, you know, maybe that it'd be easier to do that for a GHG protocol than for example, IREC where there is a VVB or an issuer, which is basically a VVB, which is basically a VVB uh, has to verify it, but that's not an explicit requirement here. So maybe we can take some liberties.
And then they, at the end of, and then in the organizational pro profile, you could set minting periods and reporting periods. And then at the end of the period that could trigger minting. And at the end of a reporting period, a report could be automatically generated. And just to illustrate a, a bit what I'm talking about, what I did here is a bit extensive to, I don't know if I have time to go over all of it, or maybe we can, maybe I can send this to you and you can ask questions or, or maybe we can have another call to go a bit more in depth into this. But basically here you can have the organizational profile which will have general information on the organ organization, what, what type of services and products, they're, what industry they're in, location of headquarters, employees, which scopes are they going to do. So I entered in some fake information here. And then uh, this, this Conglomo Corp is going to do just scope one and two. They selected 2021 as their base year. The current reporting period is this year. They want to mint monthly, or maybe there could be a manual minting. I'm not sure about that yet. A recalculation policy so they can identify different items that will, will trigger a recalculation. And so I'll give you an example. And then you can click to add targets. These are all the different pieces of information that they want you to put on your targets. They have two targets. They want to reduce 50% by 2035 and 100% by 2050. And then here, maybe you click to add entities. So maybe they have three entities that, that I made up here. And then these are their reporting metrics. So these can, for the most part, be pulled from different schema that I've created here. So like total CO2 emissions, those can be pulled from the different schemas that I've outlined here. So these reports can be generated automatically based on the inputs to these various schema. But so basically you can maybe click to add entity and then maybe you can qualify if it's organic growth or if it's an acquisition. And if, it, if you click acquisition, perhaps that could trigger recalculation or, or we can talk about those dynamics more later, but generally you click to add an entity and then all right, let's see, I didn't fill it out for the whole organization because I guess that would take a long time. I just wanted to illustrate my sort of approach. And then, so for an entity, there'd be a different schema. So entity ID, the general manager, location, employees, and then your equity share ownership. So if you choose the equity approach, you would only be responsible. You could just basically apply this 75% to the calculated emissions if you chose that. List the shareholders so that Black Pebble, they own 25%. So if we use equity share here, we gotta make sure that Black Pebble is using equity share as well. And then you click here to add assets. So I added a few hypothetical assets, a facility and a vehicle. So a facility would be an asset and then that would have its own schema where you can click to add specific sources. So for this facility, we have electrical grid consumption, natural gas consumption, scopes could be assigned to these automatically. This is scope two, this is scope one. But we've now we're adding sources to our assets and that'll have its own schema. Here we have electrical consumption, We've got our location-based, we have our location-based calculations here. So let's say they're consuming 6,000 kilowatt hours. Their sub their sub this is the subregion. This is the emissions factors associated with the subregion. And I've actually, I even added the emissions factors and everything. Here's all the emissions factors for the different subregions. And these are the residual mix factors for market-based. We have emissions factors for stationary combustion. And these are the global warming potentials. So basically to, to convert methane to CO2E, you just times it by 28. And then you can determine which egrid subregion you're in based on your zip code. So I got every zip code in America here and the, the subregions, but back to sort of how this works. So there's a schema here for, for electrical consumption, location-based. These are the e-grid location-based ones. 
These are automatically calculated. It's just basically activity data times the emissions factor, but this is divided by a thousand because we're converting kilowatt hours and these are in megawatt hours. And this is divided by to convert the pounds into tons. And then to calculate CO2E, each of these are totaled and the global warming potentials are applied to, to each one of the greenhouse gases. And then like these numbers right here, they're pulled, these reporting metrics can pull them right from the schema. And where are we? So I just wanted to show also how we're doing the market-based. And so we can click, maybe do something where you click to allocate a retired rec to the consumption of this specific facility. So let's say they clicked and they added five renewable energy certificates that have a zero emission rate of zero, but they still have uh, 1,000 left. So the 1,000 that pulls a residual mix emissions factor, but there's only a residual mix factor for CO2. So these are location-based. So remember, we have that hierarchy. So the hierarchy here would be first use the contractual emissions factors, then residual factors, and then if neither of those are available, you default to uh, location-based. These are all auto-calculated just as they were up here. And then there's a schema for the actual data that's being transmitted by the device. This is just sort of an example that I adapted from the California Independent System Operator data structure. And so basically you'd have a device and it's going to be sending data in five minute intervals and it'll have a time, a meter reading and a, a time stamped meter reading. And so if you want to, so this factor here would just be the difference, it's auto-calculating. Actually, this is auto-calculated, so I'll make that green. And this is being auto-calculated by basically just taking the difference of the value since the last tokenized, token minting and the current, the most current. Then, oh wait, that's the natural gas meter. The electrical meter, basically the same thing. And then for natural gas, same approach, it's a little bit easier because there's no dual reporting requirement, but you're just using emissions factors auto-pulled from here. And you'd have a device similar to the electrical meter where you're sending time stamp data meter readings and feeding that into this schema. So... Basically, with this approach, it would allow you to recreate the entire organization and all its entities, all its assets, and all its sources. And yeah, one, one schema feeds into the other until you have basically modeled an organization. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I got.